Part One of The Wheels of Chance. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Wheels of Chance by H. G. Wells. Chapter One The Principal Character in the Story. If you, presuming you are of the sex that does such things, if you had gone into the drapery emporium, which is really only magnificent for shop, of Messrs. Entrobus and Co., a perfectly fictitious Co., by the by, of Putney, on the 14th of August, 1895, had turned to the right-hand side, where the blocks of white linen and piles of blankets rise up to the rail from which the pink and blue prints depend, you might have been served by the central figure of this story that is now beginning. He would have come forward, bowing and swaying, he would have extended two hands with largish knuckles and enormous cuffs over the counter. He would have asked you, protruding a pointed chin, and without the slightest anticipation of pleasure in his manner, what he might have the pleasure of showing you. Under certain circumstances, as, for instance, hats, baby linen, gloves, silks, lace, or curtains, he simply would have bowed politely, and with a drooping expression, and making a kind of circular sweep, invited you to step this way, and so led you behind his ken. But under other happier conditions, huckaback, blankets, dimity, cretonne, linen, calico, are cases in point, he would have requested you take a seat, emphasizing the hospitality by leaning over the counter and gripping a chair back in a spasmodic manner, and so proceeding to obtain, unfold, and exhibit his goods for your consideration. Under which happier circumstances you might, if of an observing turn of mind, and not too much of a housewife to be inhuman, have given the central figure of this story less cursory attention. Now, if you had noticed anything about him, it would have been chiefly to notice how little he was noticeable. He wore the black morning coat, the black tie, and the speckled grey nether parts descending into shadow and mystery below the counter of his craft. And he was of a pallid complexion, hair of a kind of dirty fairness, greyish eyes, and a skimpy, immature moustache under his peaked, indeterminate nose. His features were all small, but none ill-shaped. A rosette of pins decorated the lapel of his coat. His remarks, you would have observed, were not entirely what people used to call cliché, formulae, not organic to the occasion, but stereotyped ages ago, and learnt years since by heart. This, madam, he would say, is selling very well. We are doing a very good article of four three a yard. We could show you something better, of course. No trouble, madam, I assure you. Such were the simple counters of his intercourse. So I say, he would have presented himself to your superficial observation. He would have danced about behind the counter, have neatly refolded the goods he had shown you, have put on one side those you selected, extracted a little book with a carbon leaf and a tinfoil sheet from a fixture, made you out a little bill in that weak, flourishing hand, peculiar to drapers, and have bought sign. Then a puffy little shop-walker would have come into view, looking at the bill for a second, very hard, showing you a parting down the middle of his head, meanwhile, have scribbled a still more flourishing, J.M., all over the document, have asked you if there was nothing more, have stood by you, supposing that you were paying cash, until the central figure of this story reappeared with the change. One glance more at him, and the puffy little shopwalker would have been bowing you out, with fountains of civilities at work all about you, and so the interview would have been terminated. But real literature, as distinguished from anecdote, does not concern itself with superficial appearances alone. Literature is revelation. Modern literature is indecorous revelation. It is the duty of the earnest author to tell you what you would not have seen, even at the cost of some blushes, and the thing that you would not have seen about this young man, and the thing of the greatest moment to this story, the thing that must be told if the book is to be written, was, let us face it bravely, the remarkable condition of this young man's legs. Let us approach the business with dispassionate explicitness. Let us assume something of the scientific spirit, the hard, almost professional tone of the conscientious realist. Let us treat this young man's legs as a mere diagram and indicate the points of interest where the unemotional precision of the lecturer's pointers, 
and so to our revelation on the internal aspect of the right ankle of this young man you would have observed ladies and gentlemen a contusion and an abrasion on the internal aspect of the left ankle a contrusion also on its external aspect a large yellowish bruise on his left chin there were two bruises one a leaden yellow graduating here and there into purple and another obviously of a more recent date of a blotchy red tumid and threatening proceeding up the left leg in a spiral manner an unnatural hardness and reddish would have been discovered on the upper aspect of the calf and above the knee and on the inner side an extraordinary expanse of bruised surface a kind of closely stippled shading of contused points the right leg would be found to be bruised in a marvellous manner all about and under the knee and particularly on the interior aspect of the knee so far we may proceed with our details fired by these discoveries an investigator might perhaps have pursued his inquiries further to bruises on the shoulders elbows and even the finger joints of the central figure of our story he had indeed been bumped and battered at an extraordinary number of points but enough of realistic description is as good as a feast and we have exhibited sufficient for our purpose even in literature one must know where to draw the line now the reader may be inclined to wonder how a respectable young shopman would have gotten his legs and indeed himself generally into such a dreadful condition one might fancy that he had been sitting with his nether extremities in some complicated machinery a threshing machine say or one of those haymaking furies but sherlock holmes now after a glorious career happily and decently dead would have fancied nothing of the kind he would have recognized at once that the bruises on the internal aspect of the leg considered in the light of the distribution of the other abrasions and contusions pointed unmistakably to the violent impact of the mounting beginner upon the bicycle saddle and that the ruinous state of the right knee was equally eloquent of the concussions attended on that person's hasty frequently causeless and invariably ill-conceived descents one large bruise on the shin is even more characteristic of the prentice cyclist for upon every one of them waits the jest of the unexpected treadle you try at least to walk your machine in an easy manner and whack you are rubbing your shin so out of innocence we ripen two bruises on that place mark a certain want of aptitude in learning such as one might expect in a person unused to muscular exercise blisters on the hands are eloquent of the nervous clutch of the wavering rider and so forth until sherlock is presently explaining by the help of the minor injuries that the machine ridden is an old-fashioned affair with a fork instead of a diamond frame a cushioned tire well worn on the hind wheel and a gross weight on all of perhaps three and forty pounds the revelation is made behind the decorous figure of the attentive shopman that i had an honour of showing you at first rises a vision of a nightly struggle of two dark figures and a machine in a dark road the road to be explicit from roehampton to putney hill and with this vision is the sound of a heel spurning the gravel a gasping a grunting a shouting of steer man steer a wavering unsteady flight a spasmodic turning of the missile edifice of man and machine and a collapse then you descry dimly through the dusk the central figure of this story sitting by the roadside and rubbing his leg at some new place and his friend sympathetic but by no means depressed repairing the displacement of the handlebar thus even in a shop assistant does the warmth of manhood assert itself and drive him against all the conditions of his calling against the counsels of prudence and the restrictions of his means to seek the wholesome delight of exertion and danger and pain and our first examination of the draper reveals beneath his draperies the man to which initial fact among others we shall come again in the end chapter two but enough of these revelations the central figure of our story is now going along behind the counter a draper indeed with your purchases in his arms to the warehouse where the various articles you have selected will presently be packed by the senior porter and sent to you returning thence to his particular place he seizes a folded piece of gingham 
and gripping the corners of the folds in his hands, begins to straighten them punctiliously. Near him is an apprentice, apprenticed to the same high calling of draper's assistant, a ruddy, red-haired lad in a very short, tailless black coat, and a very high collar who is deliberately unfolding and refolding some patterns of cretonne, by twenty-one, he, too, may be a full-blown assistant, even as Mr. Hoopdriver. Prints depend from the brass rails above them. Behind are fixtures full of white packages of lino, H.D., P.K., and Mull. You might imagine to see them that the two were both intent upon nothing but the smoothness of textile and rectitude of fold. But to tell the truth, neither is thinking of the mechanical duties in hand. The assistant is dreaming of the delicious time, only four hours off now, when he will resume the tale of his bruises and abrasions. The apprentice is nearer the long, long thoughts of boyhood, and his imagination rides cap a pie through the chambers of his brain, seeking some knightly quest in honour of that fair lady, the last but one of the girl apprentices to the dressmaking upstairs. He inclines rather to street fighting against revolutionaries, because then she could see him from the window. Jerking them back to the present comes the puffy little shopwalker with a paper in his hand. The apprentice becomes extremely active. The shopwalker eyes the goods in hands. Hoopdriver, he says, how's that line of G-S-E-Z-X ginghams? Hoopdriver returns from imaginary triumph over the uncertainties of dismounting. They're going fairly well, sir but the larger cheek checks seem hanging. The shopwalker brings up parallel to the counter. Any particular time when you want your holidays, he asks. Hoopdriver pulls at his skimpy moustache. No, don't want them too late, sir, of course. How about this day week? Hoopdriver becomes rigidly meditative, gripping the corners of his gingham folds in his hands. His face is eloquent of conflicting considerations. Can he learn it in a week? That's the question. Otherwise Briggs will get next week, and he will have to wait until September, when the weather is often uncertain. He is naturally of a sanguine disposition. All drapers have to be, or else they could never have the faith they show in the beauty, washability, and unfading excellence of the goods they sell you. The decision comes at last. That'll do me very well, says Mr. Hoopdriver, terminating the pause. The die is cast, the shopwalker makes a note, and it goes on to Briggs in the dresses, the next in the strict scale of precedence of the drapery emporium. Mr. Hoopdriver, in alternating spasms, anon, straightens his gingham, and anon becomes meditative with his tongue in the hollow of his decaying wisdom tooth. Chapter 3 At supper that night, holiday talk held undisputed sway. Mr. Pritchard spoke of Scotland. Miss Isaacs clamoured about the Betsy Y. Coed. Mr. Judson displayed a proprietary interest in the Norfolk broads. I said Hoopdriver, when the question came to him. Why, cycling, of course. You're never going to ride that dreadful machine of yours day after day, said Miss Howe, of the costume department. I am, said Hoopdriver, as calmly as possible, pulling at the insufficient moustache. I'm going for a cycling tour along the south coast. "'Well, all I hope, Mr. Hoopdriver, is that you'll get fine weather,' said Miss Howe, "'and not come any nasty croppers. "'And don't forget some tincture of arnica in your bag,' said the junior apprentice in the very high collar. "'He had witnessed one of the lessons at the top of Putney Hill. "'You stow it,' said Mr. Hoopdriver, looking hard and threateningly at the junior apprentice, "'and suddenly adding in a tone of bitter contempt, "'Jam pot. "'I'm getting fairly safe upon it now,' he told Miss Howe. At other times, Hoopdriver might have further resented the satirical efforts of the apprentice, but his mind was too full of the projected tour to admit any petty delicacies of dignity. He left the supper-table early so that he might put in a good hour at the desperate gymnastics upon Roehampton Road before it be the time to come back for the locking up. When the gas was turned off for the night, he was sitting on the edge of his bed, rubbing arnica into his knee, a new and a very big place, and studying a road-map of the south of England. Briggs, of the dresses, who shared the room with them, was sitting up in bed and trying to smoke in the dark. Briggs had never been on a cycle in his life, but he felt Hoopdriver's inexperience and offered such advice as occurred to him. 
have the machine thoroughly well oiled said briggs carry one or two lemons with you don't tear yourself to death the first day and sit upright never lose control of the machine and always sound the bell on every possible opportunity you mind those things and nothing very much can't happen to you hoopdriver you take my word he would laugh and lapse into silence for a minute save perhaps for a curse or so at his pipe and then break out with an entirely different set of tips avoid running over dogs hoopdriver whatever you do it's one of the worst things you can do to run over a dog never let the machine buckle there was a man killed only the other day through his wheel buckling don't scorch don't ride on the footpath keep your own side of the road and if you see a tram line go round the corner at once and hurry off into the next county and always light up before the dark you mind just a few little things like that hoopdriver and nothing much can't happen to you you take my word right you are said hoopdriver good night old man good night said briggs and there was silence for a space save some of the succulent respiration of the pipe hoopdriver rode off into dreamland on his machine and was scarcely there before he was pitched back into the world of sense again something what was it never oil the steering it's fatal a voice that came from around a fitful glow of light was saying and clean the chain daily with black lead you mind just a few little things like that lord save us said hoopdriver and pulled the bedclothes over his ears end of part one